Welcome to the Technology Pulse podcast hosted by Daily Computers, providing comprehensive technology solutions to the public and private sectors for more than 35 years. Visit www.daly.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Absolute Software, the only provider of self-healing, intelligent security solutions. And now here's your host, Rick from Daily. I am here with Dave Mundo today. Dave, welcome to the Daily Technology Pulse podcast. Thanks, Rick. Glad to be here. You and I had the pleasure of talking at the Daily Technology Showcase last year. We did a little breakout session. I really enjoyed that session so much. I wanted to get you on the podcast, so I'm really glad that you're here. Tell everybody what it is that you do at Absolute. I am the VP of Data Intelligence at Absolute Software. So Absolute, uh, we are a software cybersecurity company, and we help protect our customers' applications, making sure all their applications are running and uh, that they're healthy, et cetera. Now, my role is to manage and mine all of the cool device data that we receive on behalf of our customers. So uh, for our customers, we have our agent that's installed on their devices that works all, all of our magic, and their device data comes back to us so we can flip it back to customers in dashboards, et cetera, which is great. Well, in addition, another thing that we can do is then mine this data for our customers and provide some really cool insights and build new and different products uh, uh, based based on the data. So that's my role with an absolute. All right. So talk to me a little bit about these new and cool products. I mean, you know, you, you can't just dangle a carrot like that in front of everybody. So so tell me about some of the ones that that you've been uh, developing lately. I won't have yeah. you give away any any IP or any proprietary secrets just yet. But what are some of the what are some examples of the ones you've done lately? Yeah, I'll give you a couple examples. There's one thing that we are working on now. I mentioned our customer console, uh, that interesting data that we want to include in the console. Like, so a customer goes in now, they can see their data. So they can say, uh, see, say for instance, um, 89% of their devices are encrypted, let's say. Okay, great. Well, what a customer does not know, (laughs) is that good or is that bad? One of the things we are trying to do then is put in benchmarks for our customers. So they can say, well, for me, it's 89%. And I am in the education space. Well, how does that compare to other education uh, education uh, entities out there? Well, the average is seventy eight percent, let's say. So I'm doing better than the average. So it's uh, we're working on some things that provide some benchmarks to customers, and I think that's going to be really beneficial as we get customers thinking about this currency of data and these metrics that they can track, which will really make their device fleet even that much more hard. And that's, you know, obviously a big concern, particularly when it comes to state and local government, but pretty much for any entity. I mean, you know, obviously you talk about educational uh, entities, you talk about schools, you talk about higher ed institutions, you know, they need to protect their data because there's a lot of sensitive data there. Same thing with government customers. There's a lot of sensitive data there. So you want to make sure that you're you're really doing everything you can to protect that. But any company or even any person, you know, we, we just don't realize the amount of data that is out there that's available and how many times per day people are really trying to get a hold of that, right? It, uh, it happens all the time. And that's something every organization needs to be concerned with. You know, frankly, if something happens to a device itself, not the end of the world. It's not very expensive. In the education space, uh, it's a good example. Chromebooks, you know, relatively inexpensive. But boy, if there is important data on those devices, that's much more important and much more uh, detrimental to an organization. So yeah, totally agree. Sticking with education. So like you said, you've got student devices, not a ton on those student devices, but then you start getting into those staff devices. You start getting into people who have logins because we all do it. We all do what we're not supposed to do. Whatever browser you're using says, do you want to save your username and password? We say yes, because we want convenience in this world. And so you've got those usernames and passwords that are saved on these devices. That device gets overtaken or that device gets lost. And then what do you have? You have the potential for chaos because you have somebody who now has a login to a sensitive system and could very easily exploit that login. I'm sure that's something you hear about all the time. A hundred percent, yeah. And that's why we really stress having customer devices be encrypted 
uh, that they are monitoring how much sensitive data is on them and actually have some metrics I'll share in a bit that talk about sensitive data on devices. All those things are super important because the customers that say, oh, it's not a problem with us, all of our devices are encrypted or there's no sensitive data on all their devices. I hate to say it, they're just wrong. There, We see uh, factual evidence of encryption failing for some devices that we then will self-heal for them in many cases or sensitive data appearing on devices running rampant, right? So these are real issues. Definitely. Now, the one thing that I know we're going to talk about today that we we talked about again back in October, and that is survivorship bias. Uh, yes. So now, can you explain a little bit why we need to pay attention to some things more than other things? Yes. Yeah. So let me talk about it uh, and give you an example outside of the tech space. I'm going to talk about airplanes for a minute. (laughs) There's one visual that you see floating around the internet uh, that I'm going to reference and maybe some of the listeners are familiar with it. It's this visual of World War II bombers and how many bullet holes they have in them and where they those bullet holes were located on the plane. These planes would come back after these bombing missions and they'd be riddled with bullets and then the determination had to be made, okay, how are we going to better armor these planes? Well, the initial reaction <clears throat> is to provide armor on these areas where the bullets had hit the planes, which makes sense. Well, if you think about it though, the better solution is to add additional armor to the areas where the planes were not hit with bullets because, you hate to say it, the planes that were hit in those locations were the ones that never made it back. If a plane returned, I should say, and was riddled with bullets, where it was shot was probably pretty safe. It didn't damage the plane. The plane was able to return. But those other areas is where the planes needed to be to be better fortified. Now, this it's interesting. This was uh, this visualization from World War II, actually by a statistician. So, you know, one of my brethren, a guy named Ab- uh, Abraham Wald, and he examined the damage done to the aircraft, and he's the one who ultimately suggested that the Navy reinforce uh, these areas of the plane where the returning aircraft were unscathed. The idea, again, was inferring that the planes hit in those areas were lost. And this was actually one of the first pieces of work in operations research, which at the time was pretty new and pretty nascent. And now, of course, it's a, it's a huge component of uh, detailed decision-making in, the, in government and, and, and other orgs, okay? So that's this notion of survivorship bias where these planes were coming back. These are the ones that survived and we were able to get some information from them. But what about the planes that did not come back? We need to infer some information about them or maybe there was some data or information uh, about those planes that we'll never know. Okay, so that's the idea of survivorship bias. Now, who cares about airplanes, right? Let's tie this back to endpoint security, ultimately, which is what we care about at Absolute. Well, it's very similar. There is data that we get back from devices. These are the devices that people are using every day that are regularly connected to the internet, let's say, and calling into our servers to to provide us data. But what about those devices that are not calling in regularly or the ones that are missing, right? We need to help give customers a clear picture of what's happening on all their devices, the ones that they're using regularly, the ones maybe that they are not using regularly. So that's how this notion of survivorship bias relates to endpoint security. You start saying, okay, so we need to check on these devices that aren't being monitored regularly. How do you go about doing that? Because it's it's easy to look at planes with bullet holes, but if you're looking at devices that aren't being monitored, how then do you get that data from those devices and how do you extrapolate what you are going to extrapolate from those devices? Yeah. So this is one thing where we help we help customers with quite a bit. So if they have, let's say, uh, 5,000 devices in their fleet, right? And maybe 4,500 of those are regularly being used, regularly connected to the internet. In other words, we're seeing data from them regularly, right? Well, that means there are 500 devices that are not calling in and maybe they're missing. Maybe they're uh, just not, maybe someone's on vacation. Maybe the IT team has them, but they're just in a drawer or uh, waiting to be deployed. How we can help customers is point that out to them. And then we can help customers investigate what's happening with those devices. And this is one of the many things that we can do Uh, with Absolute. Now, what I would say, though, is this requires investigation for sure. We have had customers, as a knee-jerk reaction, say, "Um, no, that's fine. Those devices, yeah, they're just probably in a drawer somewhere. IT has them, etc. And let me tell you, I think in many cases, that's just wrong. 
So I, my recommendation to organizations is to acknowledge that there are devices that could be problematic, missing, maybe that they're unaware why, et cetera. Acknowledge it, first of all, because a lot of customers want to deny this. And then secondly, ju- do not jump to conclusions as to why it's happening. That knee-jerk reaction I mentioned, where oh, I'm sure the device is okay, IT has it. It may not be. There could be devices that are out there that are missing or maybe stolen or not healthy. Again, maybe the antivirus isn't uh, isn't up to date. At Absolute, we can provide that digital tether to help solve those problems, to help the device um, heal itself, to geolocate the device, uh, et cetera. So it's just important to acknowledge these things and then have a partner that can help you solve them and fill in these missing gaps. One thing that I think you can never do in cybersecurity is go by the old adage, out of sight, out of mind. Just because something isn't giving you a problem right now doesn't mean that it's not waiting to give you a problem or doesn't mean that it's not you know going to pop up as a problem in the future. And let's explain to, to folks how Absolute software actually works because you talk about having that digital tether and I want to make sure that they get the complete picture on that. Yeah, so I think the big thing to note here is the self-healing capabilities that we have uh, across many apps. I think it's uh, about 70 apps at this point. And these are all security applications. So think uh, VPN applications, antivirus. We have a agent that's installed on virtually every PC, uh, all the main PC manufacturers, and it's built into the BIOS, which means that every time a device is rebooted, it gets reinstalled if it's not there. So if someone goes in and says, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to steal this device and I'm going to remove Absolute's agent so it cannot be tracked. The moment they reboot that device, that agent gets reinstalled. And so then our software is back and live on the machine. That is one unique component to what we do is this unbreakable digital tether. And once that tether is live, we have that ability, as I mentioned, to heal applications. And so that's just that's one huge component of what we do. Now, couple that with some of the other things I mentioned, geolocating devices, for instance, identifying these missing or dark devices, as we call them. And it's really this full suite of solutions that we offer to customers. And then with the geolocation, you know, this is something that, again, is is really huge, particularly when it comes to a lot of these devices. It could be something unsavory. Somebody picks up a backpack and walks off with it. It could be, I went to pay my check at the, you know, at the counter at the cafe and, oh, I just didn't realize I didn't have my laptop in my bag. It's still sitting on the chair because it was charging, Uh, you know, so you have the ability to find those devices no matter what. Yeah, that's right. And really the geolocation part of it, I feel is very important as we start to think about having that full visibility of your device fleet. When we talked about survivorship bias, right? What are the missing pieces? Well, having full visibility into your device fleet is very important. And one way to do that is understanding geolocation, where these devices are located. So let me throw a couple of fun facts at you. One of the things that we look at regularly is the average number of locations a device travels to uh, over the course of a month. So think about it, right? Over the course of a month, you might go into your office, you might work from home, maybe you work at a coffee shop or you visit a client, you know, whatever the case may be. That could be three, four, five locations that you visited over the course of a month. Well, we looked at this data last year in January of 2022, and we saw an average devices in the enterprise space were uh, visited three and a half locations on average per month. Well, now here we are a year later, a year plus later, we looked at the same data in February of this year. And we are seeing that metric jump from 3.5 to now 4.2. Now you think, is that a big difference? Well, that's a 20% increase versus a year ago. It gives you some notion that devices are being more more and more mobile. Folks are traveling more. Maybe they're able to travel for their job more than they were a year ago or visiting customers more often. We're starting to see these metrics Uh, approach what we saw pre-pandemic. And by the way, that 4.2 number I mentioned, we dig into state and local government and education. It's a little bit higher in state and local government. It's 4.4 locations per devices. And uh, education, it's much lower, 3.3. And that makes sense. We see that typically in education, that this metric is a little bit lower. Think about the student, right? The student's going to be in school. They're going to be at home. That's probably going to be about it. Maybe they go to a friend's house, et cetera. In enterprise organizations and with state and local government, though, we see 
that these metrics are a little bit higher. Again, all of this jives with this work from anywhere world that we are in now. Devices are becoming more mobile. That also means they are being used in less secure environments, right? Uh, Attached to more networks that maybe aren't the most secure thing. And especially if you don't have a VPN or the VPN is not working, this could be a situation. Now, I mentioned about four locations per device. Again, that's the average. So that means you likely have a coworker out there who's visiting six, seven, eight, nine locations on their device. So there are some devices that are going to be much higher than this average, of course. So I guess the takeaway here is more locations means various networks, which means less secure devices. Now that folks are back in the office, this heightened sense of security that we had when we were working from home uh, has dropped a little bit. And so we need to keep up our sense of vigilance. People are traveling. We just need to make sure our devices are super secure in that regard. In the height of the pandemic, everybody was home. So, you know, you, you were, you were just on your home network, but then there were some people that, oh, you know, I, I just, once, once the world started to open up again, oh, I need to get out of the house. I, I'm going to work from the local coffee shop for a little while. So, it's fine to go down to the local coffee shop. It's fine to go down to the local diner. And yes, every place now has Wi-Fi. But if you're just connecting to it where they don't say, oh, here's what our Wi-Fi is and here's what the password is. If you're just trusting that it's going to be uh, a Wi-Fi network that is associated with that business, that is a big assumption to make. And we all know what happens when you assume. It's never good. <laughs> no. What do you do with this data? What are what are some of the the data points that you can extrapolate that will really help you guide enterprises uh, as to what to do with their devices? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of things that we can look at for a customer, and I'll give you a few examples. And I'm going to focus on some of the state and local government metrics that we've looked at in education as well. So one big metric I just alluded to is the percent of devices that are unencrypted, right? So the smaller, the better. If uh, 0% of your devices are unencrypted, that's great. For state and local government, on average, we are seeing that 28% of devices are unencrypted. It's just a huge number, right? Uh, why is that important? Again, if something happens with the data, we want to make sure a bad guy or with the device, we, we want to make sure a bad guy cannot get at the data. And so the fact that that's 28% is pretty high in state and local government. Let me compare that to enterprise. When we look at enterprise organizations in total, and I'm talking about uh, healthcare companies and financial services and consulting companies, we see that that percentage is only 16%. So state and local government is really uh, doing a much worse job, I guess, at encrypting devices. So this is something that I would encourage any state and local government customer of dailies or listener of the podcast to really investigate. Uh, how am I doing on encryption, right? You really want to make sure that all your devices are encrypted. So right. that's now, I, I can only imagine. So state and local government, again, you're, you're talking more than one in four devices yep. are unencrypted. That's right. That's Those are not odds that I want to take. And so then we go over to the education space. Do I dare ask, is it that much worse? Is it, you know, maybe in the 40s, maybe in the 50s, somewhere in there? Yeah, education is really bad in this regard. Now, now we've heard, disclaimer here, we've heard from education customers that encryption isn't as important to them. And, you know, first, when I hear that, I scratch my head and I say, why? And I think it's because they feel they don't have a ton of, Uh, sensitive data on their devices, right? In the data, we see that that unencrypted percentage is approaching 80%. It's 78%. So most devices are floating around there in the education space and they're not encrypted. So whenever we see this for our education customers, we always flag it for them. Now, sometimes they might say, well, there are reasons why encryption, again, isn't as important to us, but boy, again, to any education folks listening today, please go back to the ranch and uh, determine... Uh, what your encryption is looking like, because if it's as bad as the data we're seeing, something really needs to be done in that regard. Right. And, and again, you go back to what can someone do with that data? Because that's, that's what a lot of people don't understand. So take, for example, the student devices, you, you don't think there's a lot of sensitive data on there, but I know that they have their logins to the educational system. I know that they have their logins to their Google drives. It's information like that, that you don't think 
is something that a bad actor is really going to care about until all of a sudden somebody takes down your entire education platform. When they when somebody gets in and takes that entire thing down because they were able to exploit a, you know a backdoor into it because they had a valid login mm-hmm. and then tell me that hearing that somebody says encryption isn't that important it's like somebody who says oh money isn't all that important <laughs> it's like oxygen you don't think it's important until you don't get enough that's right <laughs> and then you need it yeah exactly it kind of uh it boggles the mind to some extent and so this is something we're really monitoring closely and we are discussing with customers and again if customers are using our self healing capability if they have encryption apps installed and they fail, that's something we can help them repair. Is updating devices, is that one of the things that you look at as well? So one of the things we monitor closely is how behind on patching devices are. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say a new patch comes out uh, today and I update it today. So great, I am zero days behind on patching. Good for me, right? Well, let's say another patch comes out and I don't update for three, four, five days. Well, I'm suddenly five days behind on patching. And then I'm 10 days behind if I keep hitting later, right? And so a device could just never be updated or it really takes a while for it to be updated. So one of the things we look at is on average, the number of days a device is behind on its Windows 10 patching. And in state and local government, again, for instance, that average is 68 days. So it's over two months behind on patching. Now, let me say, I think it's sensible that many organizations don't update patching right away in some cases, right? You kind of know what's going on here. There's an IT org that is hesitant to update to the latest patches because they want to make sure it doesn't break all of their applications that they're using, right? So Uh, Don't update right away, employees. We're going to wait a little bit and make sure that this patch is compatible with everything, which, you know, you could you could see that totally makes sense. As long as an an, as an IT org knows what they're doing and they know the implications of that, that might be okay. But they need to know that. Right. Sixty eight days. Is that too much? Is that too little? That's really up to the organization to decide what are they comfortable living with. Right. Um, so that's 68 days for state and local government. When again we compare it to enterprise in total, it's 60 days. So it's a little bit worse than average. But again, education is much higher. It's 112 days. So we're talking about nearly four months behind on Windows 10 patching. Again, IT orgs, if you're comfortable with that, okay. But boy, you really should be aware if you're behind or not and why you're behind. You really need to update that patching as soon as you can. I mean, try going 112 days late on your mortgage and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, good luck, right? <laughs> Having it be that far behind on patches because these things get released for a reason. Yes. there There's a vulnerability that somebody has learned to exploit. That's and right. And the fine folks over at Microsoft, they're putting this out there because they're trying to protect their users. And if the user just sits there and says, nah, I'm going to drive without the seatbelt for a little while. Yeah, like what 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 could go wrong, right? And uh, and I'll tell you another fun fact here. When you think about complexity, when we look across all of our customer customer data, we see 14 different versions of Windows out there that are being utilized, right? Uh, so good luck managing all those 14 versions. And when you talk about patching, and again, I'm talking about the uh, weekly Tuesday patches ultimately that are released. Uh, by Microsoft, for instance. In the wild, we see over 800 different builds slash patches, whatever you want to call them, out in the wild, which is just so crazy, right? It's just so this notion of complexity in the environment. Um, these, these things are hard to manage, but boy, the better we patch things, the better off we're going to be. What else do you look at? Yeah, I guess the the one other thing that is pretty interesting to note, similar to encryption, the percent of devices that have an unhealthy antivirus, right? We talk about encryption working or not working. Same with antivirus. It could be working great. Everything's fine. However, if you're not on the most recent version or the service isn't running, let's say, that could be unbeknownst to the user. And suddenly your antivirus software is not working. It's not healthy. Again, Absolute can help because we can help self-heal many antivirus applications. However, in the wild, sometimes that doesn't occur. And so in state and local government, we're seeing 11% of devices have an unhealthy antivirus. And that's a little bit worse than we see more broadly in enterprise. It's just 9% in enterprise. And in education, it's just a little bit higher. It's 13%. But I got to tell you, Rick, like depending 
9%, 11, 13, whatever it is, that's still a pretty high number. Uh, you know, again, if you have a thousand devices and 11% of them have an unhealthy AV, you've got 110 that are running around out there with an unhealthy AV, right? Which could be really bad. Again, think about if there's data on them, what can be compromised, et cetera. So, you know, there are many metrics I feel we can look at and we do, we help customers with, but these are three of the big ones, in my opinion, this uh, percent of healthy or unhealthy antivirus uh, encryption, as well as being days behind on Windows 10 patching. This is all stuff to monitor closely, in my view. Do you ever track how much data is actually sensitive data for your customers? Yeah, this is one additional security risk that we see on devices all the time. So at Absolute, we have a DLP, data loss prevention solution, that when customers enable, it scans the device and it simply flags if it finds any sensitive data. And to be clear, what I mean is uh, PII, for instance, uh, or any, any information that could be personal, bank account numbers, social security numbers, names, addresses, phone numbers, things like that, right? So we have this DLP solution that scans for that. We're not collecting that data, obviously. We're just enumerating how many times we see it on a device ultimately. And we are really seeing that the amount of sensitive data has ramped up since the pandemic. Think about it, right? Before the pandemic, you're in the office, you're connected to the corporate network. You might go to a shared drive to uh, use some data that's sensitive, right? And that's what you should be. But then suddenly folks are working from home and oh, I don't want to connect to the VPN or the shared drive and it's slow and it's kind of a pain. Instead, I'm just going to download that Excel file locally and I'll just edit it on, on my local machine. Well, guess what? Now you have a lot of sensitive data that is on your device because you literally just downloaded it to your device. So this is something we've really seen ramp up since the pandemic and it's not slowing down. So this is this is less of an issue in education. So currently, we are seeing nearly half of devices, 47% of devices, have any type of sensitive data on them. And I guess the one bad thing about education is just two years ago, that was 35%. So we've seen it go from 35 to 47% in two years. Now, boy, I guess as I say that out loud, it doesn't sound that great. 40% is still a pretty high number. But compared to some of the enterprise metrics we see, I guess it's better, but boy, state and local government currently over 80% of devices has set, have sensitive data. When we compare that to enterprise in total, we see it's about 76%. So again, in state and local government, it's a little bit higher than what we're seeing in enterprise. But the one takeaway here is this, it's really increased over the past two years. We're not seeing this slow down. Folks are used to storing this data locally now and boy, you know, don't do it. We talked about encrypted devices. Now think of the combination of the two. Unencrypted devices that have all this sensitive data, this is a, a recipe for disaster, right? So if I think back to this survivorship bias topic that we discussed, again, knowing what's happening on your devices, having visibility into your devices, this is part of it. Understanding how much sensitive data uh, there is on devices, uh, alar alerting your employees minimize that as best you can. That's really what we're encouraging here for, for our customers. Again, you don't know what you don't know. And so you don't really think that it's a problem to have this information, this sensitive information on a device until you realize what somebody can do with it. You don't figure, okay, being a couple of days behind on patching, uh, try a couple of months behind on patching. You don't think that that's going to be a problem, but then you start to understand and have someone not just summarize that for you, but synthesize that for yeah, that's right. And again, it's putting this, putting these metrics, putting this data in front of customers, because a lot of them have these assumptions on how their devices are performing, how the metrics are looking. And look, you can think about this in any industry, right? Like I, I think I know what the truth is, but boy, we're showing them the real data and we're showing them the facts, right? So we just want to make sure that customers can acknowledge this and make sure that they take action to, uh, to remediate any sensitive data they have, the antivirus not working, any of these things we talked about. That's why the data is so important because it gives you a benchmark to track against. You can see how you improve over time as you're getting assistance from daily, from absolute, et cetera. Um, looking, at, looking at this information is just so crucial, I feel. All right, Dave, again, thanks so much for joining the Technology Pulse. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks a lot, Rick. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Technology Pulse podcast produced by Daily. 
Before we go, we would like to remind you of a few legal considerations. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Daily or its leadership. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide legal, financial, or other professional advice. The content of this podcast is protected by copyright laws and may not be reproduced, distributed, or transmitted without the written permission of Daily Computers Inc. Any products, services, or other references mentioned in this podcast are for informational purposes only and do not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Daily. Thank you again for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact us at marketing at daily.com.